So as people are popping in here, and um, Oscar, I see people are showing up. Oscar, of course, if you, by the way, are the first, you're just joining us, we're doing a little bantering before we start. Uh, my name is Ken Rakowski. I'm one of the hosts over at the FinTech Surge and Blockchain Summit, Future Blockchain Summit, which is happening October 17th through the 20th, which we're very, very excited about. It's going to be one of the biggest events in the world focusing on what's going on with the blockchain, cryptocurrency, and anything around the whole fintech space. So you don't want to miss out on that. And if you go to Fintech Surge, we have incredible uh, packages that are available there. Oscar, who is uh, right there at the top, at least in my window, Oscar is one of the big wigs. He, as where I'm at, I'm in Bali, they would call him the big boss, who's uh, putting this event together. Anything you want to add regarding the event that's happening, Oscar? It's going to be amazing, just like it was back in December, live and in person. We're combining a lot of our big tech shows during JITEX uh, in October, and many speakers have already confirmed. Thanks to you, Ken, we got Akon headlining Future Blockchain Summit so far, and uh, many more. But I, I want people to understand what you said J during JITEX, which which is an incredible epicenter. So when you come to FinTech Surge and Blockchain Summit, Future Blockchain Summit, you are also in this other great massive event that's going on. So there's so much to see. It's like the best place for a wandering mind, isn't it? So you can explore so much. Yeah, it's the best show in the world. Whoa, there's a lot of confidence behind that statement. It really is. So we're going to be starting in about a minute and a half. As people are congregating, we have an amazing group that is going to be with us today. Uh, Christina, who I'm very excited, you'll be seeing her on a regular basis here. And uh, she is one of the, actually, uh, Cointelegraph really probably wouldn't be able to be powered without her. Can you tell us a little more about what Cointelegraph is? Thank you, Ken. Well, Cointelegraph is one of the leading publications dedicated to cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And we are trying to bring quality journalism into the space. And this has been exciting years. So I'm with, with Cointelegraph for four years already. We've been launched uh, in uh, 2013. And since then, well, the, the, the future is here. So I'm really looking forward to these discussions. Kind of fascinating that time parameter, because if you go just around that 2016, that was like the ICO craze. You got to see that. And now we're in the uh, NFT craze, right? You get to see these little bubbles and windows. And which one's going to last longer, ICOs or NFTs? Which one do you think? Crypto. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> so we're going to start about uh, a little under a minute. And I want to suggest all of you that are out there watching us, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas, please put them inside the Q&A space. We'll make sure we go over there. We have three guests that will be joining Christine and I today, and we'll be focusing on what's going on with the central banking system. And of course, your questions, your comments, your ideas. How about what's happening with the digital uh, euro? Where is that going? Are they gonna be following what China is doing with the digital yuan? Don't know, we'll find out more. But again, your questions, your comments, your ideas, please submit them. And uh, I'd like to do a countdown, Oscar, when we're about to, do we have the, the, the fancy countdown clock or we're not doing that? Oh, we're not doing it this time. Uh, we'll uh, just smoothly transition to going live. So I think it's time to kick it off. It's uh, 12 noon sharp. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Christina, for uh, hosting our new series of uh, webinars for Future Blockchain Summit and FinTech Surge, the advanced team sessions that we have planned every two weeks from today. We're kicking off with a very prominent panel, very timely, John Whelan just um, is in the center of a new project uh, with the new um, EIB, Banco Santander, Society General that we'll be hearing from. He's joining us a little later. He's just uh, tying up the sack as we speak. And uh, Smart Dubai, who's been uh, part of Future Blockchain Summit since we launched. We have them back today on this uh, talking about the cashless societies that um, they are pioneering with their work at the moment. Well, I'm very glad to hand over to you now, Ken and Christina. So I'm Ken Rakowski. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a talk show host in the States and I helped put together a lot of events, but one of my favorite events is what's going on in Dubai and that's the Future Blockchain Summit and FinTech Surge. And that's October 17th through the 20th. And what we're doing through these series of, let's, let's not even call them webinars because these are your opportunity to ask questions and really dive in. I want you to meet the speakers and the personalities that will be at this event happening in October. 
think of this like a, a, an appetizer. That's all this is because you could really dive in deep with these people in October. And we'll be doing this every other week. And we have very prominent speakers, Brett King, who's written the bank series, Bank 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, be joining us. We also have Akon who'll be joining us in the next few weeks. So stay tuned, subscribe if you're not a subscriber to our mailing list and get involved. My co-host, that's what you are, Christina, co-host, there she is, who's joining us from outside Venice, Italy, not California. I'm in Bali, Indonesia, tro totally global. Christina, tell everyone what you uh, your focus is and about Cointelegraph. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you very much for, for having me here. So I'm Christina Lucrezia Corner. I'm managing editor at Cointelegraph, one of the biggest publications dedicated to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And I'm excited to talk about, uh, about the space. I've been here for four years already. And every day brings us new exciting news. So I will be happy to talk about some of this today as well. I love that. Explain exactly what Cointelegraph does, because some people might be brand new and why it's really important to be watching and reading what's happening in Cointelegraph. Well, to make things short, we are Bloomberg for crypto. So we are the voice of crypto and uh, we are not only writing in English, but we also have 10 regional versions, including Arabic, including Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, German, uh, Turkish, I think. I think I have enumerated all of them. So Christina, just, you should have just said what languages you're not published in. It would have been a lot easier. Uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we so, are working on that. We are working on new versions as well. <laughs> what we're going to do, and this is what our, our schedule is going to be, is we're going to look at what the latest news is right at the top of the hour when it comes to the crypto or let's just call it blockchain space. And I'm kind of going to let Christina, you get to run with this because your, your finger's on the pulse of everything. What is top of mind right now? Thank you, Ken. Well, honestly, that's that's really a big responsibility because there are so many exciting news. So first of all, most visually pleasant one is that we got back to green this week after, after a kind of a negative trends during the last days. Um, so I would rather see it not as a result of big macro event, but I see it as regaining uh, bullish momentum for all the crypto industry. Um, so uh, moreover, the price of Ether yesterday broke uh, out to new all-time high. I think it's somewhere near 2,700. Uh, and this is related to a very successful launch of Berlin upgrade last week, but also to a new deal by the uh, European Investment Bank, who uh, announced it is launching a two-year 100 million euro digital bond sale using the Ethereum network. And the sale will be led by Goldman Sachs, Societe Generale, and Banco Santander. And no, you know what? We will have a speaker today from Banco Santander. So I'm really excited to learn from the first hand about this news. Um, other positive contributions have been made by some rumors and announcements. So thus, for example, according to some media insights, an American giga bank baptized the unlikest bank to embrace crypto in the US, GP Morgan Chase, reportedly will roll out its Bitcoin fines. And you know what, when? Already this summer. Well, we, it's not confirmed. So is that the rumor that I'm throwing here? But I think that's a very interesting dynamics to, to follow. And uh, not, not later than I think an hour ago, uh, GP Morgan and DBS uh, uh, announced that they're launching new blockchain cross-border payment firm. Uh, I think the news haven't yet even been published on Cointelegraph, so this is exclusive for you. Um, another nice, uh, nice news came from Gemini, that is a New York-based cryptocurrency exchange. So they are now joining a club of other exchanges who already launched their crypto debit cards. Uh, that is Binance, uh, Coinbase, Crypto.com, and other platforms. So now you have you can have a debit card by uh, by Gemini, and also have uh, some reward system up to three percent uh, cashback. Speaking about rewards, um, Tesla reported this week that it made a huge profit by selling a portion of its Bitcoin that it purchased back in February. You remember this 
boom in uh, in Bitcoin's price and all the uh, crypto markets, it was also related to the fact that t- Tesla, uh, I think it was one and a half billion dollars invested in uh, in Bitcoin. So now they wanted to prove the liquidity of uh, their crypto assets and they sold 10% of their holdings. Uh, Elon Musk though, precise that he keeps hodling. <laughs> I yes. Think yeah, but not just, but not just Bitcoin. I mean, he's obviously in Doge. He's playing around with so many different types of altcoins, and everyone's almost waiting for him to pick the next one, which yeah, I find pretty entertaining. I mean, this this Twitter influence or influence on the markets is just incredible, and definitely Elon Musk is the star here. But you know what, what concerns me is this is exactly what this stock market really wants to prevent. And that is to have people that have that Twitter ability just to press a button, send it, and all of a sudden you see that asset go up in price radically fast. And there's ways of preventing that in, in the traditional stock market where the crypto markets do not have that type of protection. So we see that roller coaster ride, like again, like Doge, that should never have jumped up like that because there was real no perceived value. Yeah, that's very interesting because definitely there is a lot of skepticism also uh, by big players that are entering the market. But at the same time, for example, um, this Sunday, there was an interview with the PayPal CEO, Dan Schulman, uh, on the Time magazine. And he actually revealed that demand on the crypto side has been multiple fault what they initially expected. So I remind you, uh, back in November last year, uh, PayPal uh, embraced crypto for its customers. Um, and uh, since then has been expanding its crypto related services. So it's launched uh, a crypto checkout service in uh, late March uh, and uh, to allow crypto payments for merchants. It also introduced crypto training for its uh, uh, its uh, pl- its payments platform Venmo, uh, trading for four uh, largest cryptocurrencies. Well, one of uh, some of the largest. You know which? So Bitcoin, Ether, Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin. And uh, I'm really eager to know how how we will be deba- de- developing. Uh, PayPal definitely entered the space. And relevant to our discussion today, Dan Schulman also told that uh, central bank have to start thinking about embracing digital currencies. Definitely, this, this will be game changer in the, in the months to come. Two things that I think are interesting are we're starting to see unique altcoins that have a real purpose in the real world. And I have two I want you to, one is not reported on, and it's called the purple token or purple coin. I think I told you briefly about it. They are looking at what's considered, I I like to call it the, uh, well, let's just put it this way, the disabled market. People that have disabilities, they're creating a token for almost 22% of the world's population. So when this purple token is used at a brand like a Nike or um, at a Tesla, there's a discount or a benefit by the user of this token. Brilliant move. And then I like what this this Super Doge did. The Super Doge just launched the other day and they're giving a percentage to charity. And I think they've already donated almost $200,000 in three days to charities. So they're taking the old Blake Mikowski idea of Tom's shoes, where you buy one pair and you get another pair to charity. They're doing what we're starting to see is these these socially correct type of tokens looking at charities to give them a benefit of the token launch, which I love seeing this. So I'm very excited to see these two things happening. That is awesome. Can I call it deep purple token? (laughs) (laughs) You're too young to know what deep purple is. Come on. (laughs) That's classic. So today, again, we want you all to remember that this is a lead up to FinTech Surge and the Future Blockchain Summit, which is happening October 17th through the 20th of October. Again, we want you to get there, get there early, enjoy Dubai. It's an amazing one of my favorite places on the planet Earth. And uh, we'll be meeting all the speakers today. Plus, if you want to spend more time with Christina and myself, we'll be there also. So make sure you get there. It's an amazing place to be. It's the epicenter of opportunity when it comes to what's going on with crypto. And um, so what we'd like to do is like to start with our first guest today. And uh, Amira, you're joining us today. Thank you very much for being here with us today. And um, I know that you wanted to present some stuff in front of us. And you have a a presentation to show us? 
Yes, hi, Ken, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from around the world, and thank you for joining us. And special thanks for the team from uh, Fintech Surge and the Future Blockchain Summit for hosting us. Just give me a second while I share my screen. Let me know when it's good to go. We see you. We got it. Perfect. So, all right, so um, I'm here today to um, present to you the Cashless Dubai Initiative, which has been something very exciting that we've been working on for the past uh, six to eight months. So just to set the scene, I'd like to give you a bit of uh, background context. So over 2019 and the first half of 2020, and as part of our continuous work in the advancing of the Emirates of Dubai's journey in becoming the smartest and happiest city on earth, which is actually the vision of Smart Dubai, uh, and uh, so Smart Dubai and its partners worked on developing the Cashless Dubai Framework Report, outlining uh, the government, the governance ecosystem, uh, policy levers, regulatory and industry initiatives, technology, and also cultural drivers that are critical to uh, driving the transition towards a cashless society and ensuring that a, there is a seamless experience for both businesses and consumers alike. The shift towards the cashless society, of course, has many important returns for cities and countries and has gained a ginormous importance in the recent times, considering the COVID-19 and everything that happened uh, with it, uh, as countries saw cashless payments as a safer way to limit the spread of the virus, to put it in simple terms. So we were able to quantify actually the impact of COVID on shopping and payment, payment behaviors through YouGov's e, uh, latest survey, where we see that 71% of retail consumers prefer digital channels over cash, and 61% of e-commerce consumers use cash and use cards and wallets more than the cash on delivery option online. Additionally, the benefits of going cashless have been eliminated, uh, the, estimated through the visa report on cashless society in the year 2017. Uh, for Dubai, these benefits were estimated to be 1.88 uh, uh, AED increase in government revenues, um, 2.2 uh, uh, billion AED increase in uh, individual savings, and 5.5 billion uh, AED increase in business revenue. And that is, of course, in addition to an addition, a wide range of catalytic benefits, such as wage growth and jobs created. So to that extent, and with, in line with the leadership's vision and positioning Dubai amongst the smartest and happiest cities on earth, the government of Dubai formed what is now known as the Cashless Dubai Initiative, a Cashless Dubai Working Group, tasked with developing and implementing a roadmap for seamlessly and safely transitioning Dubai towards a cashless society. Uh, the working group consists of director generals of all local authorities that are concerned with the transformation of Dubai into a cashless society, in addition to an executive team that includes representatives from each agency that are working on ground to implement and work on a roadmap that would take us forward. So uh, the working group has identified six focus areas that represent pockets of cash that are essential for the transition of Dubai towards a cashless society. These are government services, peer-to-peer -peer transactions, retail and services, unbanked and underbanked, and of course, tourism spending having Dubai via, via the tourism hub uh, in the region. And accordingly, work has been divided as per the areas of expertise and influence of each government entity that is related to the work here. In addition to, uh, to that, of course, you know, there's a big role that uh, any government can have through the, uh, the, the governance layer that can, can, that can be provided, which is the added value of a government when it comes to an initiative like this. So uh, entities such as Smart Dubai, we're uh, in charge of advising on technology. The Executive Council of Dubai is in charge of working hand in hand uh, with all the government entities to support them in implementing the roadmap to remove any barriers that are available. Then, then there's the Supreme Legislation Committee, which is in charge of issuing issuing legislations and regulations that will work hand in hand with us to, 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 to speed up and expedite all uh, uh, regulatory and legislation issues that would hinder the, uh, the uh, achieve, achieving the goals of a cashless society. We also would like to ensure economic security and of course ensure the consumer protection from cyber crimes and of course the different budgetary requirements to achieve the goals that uh, the cashless working group has. 
Of course, uh, there are lots of enabling factors that are necessary for achieving the success of these focus areas, such as having an agile and enabling regulatory initiatives, consumer protection, like you just mentioned, from cyber crimes. Uh, very important player, which is the collaboration between the private sector and startups in order to enable them to support the government's initiative here, develop fast and reliable technology. Of course, awareness and marketing campaigns for individuals to be on board with us, having governance through the working group, compliance, between the sectors, of course, innovation through crowdsourcing and uh, which, with an ultimate goal to increase competitiveness of Dubai and the region in when it comes to cashless societies. And of course, leveraging on the digital identity UAE pass, which has been uh, something that is a product of different government entities, not only in Dubai, but within the entire UAE and using that to enable uh, the transition to a cashless uh, society. So we have also engaged the private sector. Uh, uh, we have actually, we have uh, over the past few months, we have engaged a lot of uh, government entities and conducted a lot of workshops to brainstorm and come up with initiatives. We've had more than 35 hours of brainstorming sessions, which uh, cultivated into seven large scale initiatives, which we're working towards uh, achieving four medium scale initiatives and 12 initiatives that are uh, currently in the market where we look to enhance uh, these existing solutions to come up with uh, more innovative ideas Ideas to take them forward. Of course, these initiatives, these uh, brainstorming sessions were attended by the highest level and highest ranks of the government uh, officials we have here in Dubai, different working groups, different teams within different entities to come up with end to end solutions. And uh, not only that, but we have also engaged with the private sector and listened to their feedback with more than 250 feedback points have, that have been received uh, uh, for the cashless working groups. We've had four local banks, we've had seven solution providers, and with different other stakeholders, more than 70 attendees with us that have worked closely with us uh, to map out key roles in Dubai's journey to become uh, a cashless society as well. So um, to that extent, I'd like to invite you all who's been, uh, who is very interested to, uh, to attend uh, and be part of our journey to reach out to me through my, the email that is available on screen and express your interest for you to, to, to know more and learn more about what we're doing and for us to, 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 part, to, to, ask, to enable you to participate with us in, in our journey. And thank you so much. Mira, are you opening up APIs for people to plug into this as this becomes more proliferating throughout Dubai? Yes, of course. So uh, one of the initiatives we're working on with our colleagues from the Economic Development uh, de Department in Dubai is a unified payments network, which will en enable uh, lots of startup companies and different companies, banks to plug in their APIs and, and join a unified network and a solution that is available for consumers and businesses and unbanked, underbanked alike. So um, like I mentioned, uh, any companies with APIs that are already ready to be plugged in can reach out to us and we can connect them with the team working on the network that can uh, take this forward. And are you creating also a way for other countries to be plugging into this to where you create some type of universal platform that's just not Dubai, but some type of open source to allow other parts of the world to be part of this? Of course. So uh, like I mentioned in the slide, which talks about the focus areas of the cashless initiative, one of our main pillars is tourism spending. So um, imagine you yourself as a tourist coming into Dubai, um, coming in from China, and you've got your, your Alipay account or your WeChat account. And I don't think anyone coming into Dubai for two, three days would invest in opening a new account or tapping into a new wallet. So we want to enable these sort of wallets to, to just integrate seamlessly into our network and for any person, individual coming into Dubai to, to use what he as existing and uh, and transact in Dubai uh, in a cashless manner. You know, but I, I I don't know if I fully agree with that. I think that the RTA is probably the lowest hanging fruit opportunity because even tourists, when they come in, they don't realize how much of the RTA they're going to be utilizing, you know, from the ground transportation to the boats to, you know, any of one of the many ways that might be the best way to get them into the system right away is using the RTA. So, so, so of course, you know, uh, one of one of our key pillars in Smart Dubai is to give convenience to all. So, if you were, it depends on your personality. You think about it as RTA and RTA and RTA and the Null team from RTA are one of our key stakeholders in the cashless initiative. And RTA and and the Null system and the Null card is one of the main enablers to achieve uh, what we aim to achieve with with over the next few years uh, to become a cashless society. But if you were a person who was not open to that, we want to give you that option as well to use your local currency card to use your local wallet to to uh to transact in the city so it's all about opportunities convenience for all i love it wow again this is why dubai is in the lead just the way you're thinking 
And your, your, your team is looking at what the best practices all over the world and applying it in Dubai is what you're doing. Yeah, we're very ambitious and we're very excited with what we, we were going to be able to achieve in a, in a short period of a two, three year span. So countries have been working on this for longer years and they, they achieved some, some we, we want to achieve a lot more in, in a much shorter period of time. Well, thank you so much for joining us, giving us such a great presentation. Christina, any thank questions? Any uh, parts of the minor are authorized. Whoa, that sounds like a business deal going on. Let me pop, mute that. All right. <laughs> Christina, well, any questions? Just, well, I'm really excited by all the amount of uh, interesting news coming from Dubai related to digital payments and fintech and blockchain. So where do you guys find this energy? Like, how do you manage to think of this innovation thing while, while all around you, like the, the world is thinking about the pandemic, the crisis management, et cetera. And Dubai, I, I've been to Dubai in February. It was fabulous. And like, I think that the, the, the structure of mine is actually different there. So what what are your tips for this innovative thinking? So I think the key here in Dubai, which is a game changer, uh, is the leadership and the leadership support to all government entities, individuals, businesses, and everything. So when the pandemic happened, you know, uh, we have teams that are dedicated to work, working towards the pandemic and achieving all goals to eliminate, uh, you know, the spread of the disease and working with uh, relevant government entities to uh, to uh, with, in regards to protocol and all. But at the same time, other 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 government entities tasked with different approaches have all have stepped the gas and. Uh, not stopped working on different initiatives and different ideas that we have. Um, we have a humongous support from the leadership. They're aware of everything that's happening within every different government entity. And all they all they keep saying is, keep going. You have our full support. And whatever you need, we're, we're, we're just here. And whatever ideas you have, uh, propose them. And we're, ne we're never going to say no if, if they're there for the benefit of Dubai and the people here. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is a fantastic thing. Again, October 17th through or 16th through the 20th. Get over to Dubai, check it out, and you can actually see all these initiatives in, in play. Mira, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Ken. All right. So I want to actually go to our, our, our next guest who is like the just closing a big deal. John, you got to be so damn excited. What has happened? Is the ink dry? Um, <laughs> barely. And I apologize for being late, by the way. Um, so uh, John Whelan here, I'm the uh, Managing Director of the Digital Assets Program at Banco Santander in Madrid. Um, you may have been following some of the, uh, let's say, crypto, blockchain, uh, central bank digital currency news over the past week or two. Um, we're in the process right now. I'm, I'm actually on another call as we speak. Um, one of our clients, uh, the European Investment Bank, which is the, I think, the world's largest issuer of uh, bonds, um, uh, mandated uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, Societe Generale, and Banco Santander as joint lead managers on a digital bond, a blockchain-based bond issuance. Um, not, not a huge quantity necessarily, 100 million euro, um, two-year tenor, um, but the entire thing uh, uh, is being cleared and settled and registered on the public Ethereum blockchain which uh, by itself is a bit of a stretch. You know, most of the transactions that are done in the, in the financial industry uh, in these environments are uh, often on private permission networks or, or in a more controlled manner. And, and we kind of have taken the step now of doing a, a digital bond issuance with a, a real legitimate AAA issuer. Um, perhaps, I, I don't know what the, let's say government of Dubai credit rating is, but you know, a, a, a top tier uh, issuer uh, in Europe um, multiple dealers, uh, first uh, a digital bond transaction ever done with, uh, with three uh, joint lead managers, all of whom are, you know, top tier name brand financial institutions. And then I think uh, interesting as well is the, the fact that this particular bond issuance uh, is, is in the market for real uh, for institutional investors outside of the United States. They can, they can purchase this bond like they would any other bond. And the part that... Um, I think is interesting for the whole uh, you know digital cash conversation is that the entire transaction itself at least at the underwriting step uh, involves settlement with a legitimate um, CBDC central bank digital currency that was provided by the Bank de France uh, which is one of the you know members of the European Central Bank Eurozone area uh, as part of their experimental program uh, taking taking the step forward so 
somewhere out there, I'll have to check my, my, uh, my chats, but somewhere out there uh, are some ERC20 transactions on the public Ethereum blockchain that represent a legitimate uh, mainstream real world uh, people would say CFI, centralized finance, but you know I would say uh, CFI that is uh, uh, by no means um, asleep at the wheel, but CFI understanding this new world of of, of what's coming with uh, uh, DLT uh, technology for capital markets transactions and other things. So maybe that's a long introduction, and I apologize oh, by the way. I'm literally in the middle of this thing as we speak. Yeah, no, it's all good. Off, I, 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 it'll be back to that. John, is, is there a concern at all regarding the speed of that network? The Ethereum network is not obviously the fastest. So how, how are you handling the speed issue? I don't think you understand how the financial system works. You try to transfer money <laughs> one country to another. What's a few minutes, man? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But, um, so 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 let's let's I think we need to be clear about something. So um I don't think anybody suggests that Ethereum or any other blockchain network is uh, useful for, uh, let's say, high frequency trading or anything like that. It's not really that as such, but it is extremely useful for, and which is what French law actually explicitly allows for. And this particular bond transaction we did was under French law, and maybe there's a topic for another time, settlement. Settlement is not something that has to happen instantaneously. Settlement is when you and I agree as counterparts to a transaction that we want the exchange of title of cash and securities to occur. And settlement usually in the financial industry is T plus five. We agree a trade and then we wait five days for settlement. Let me tell you about a new future. We agree a trade and three to five minutes later, settlement occurs. Mm. So, you know, people mistake the, I, I think, People from the crypto world, you know, they see something different than we see in the financial world about the potential utility of these networks. And that's something that's important. I'm a blockchain engineer. I Listen, I can get into the weeds of the cryptography and how it works. But on the financial industry side, there are reasons why these autonomous, neutral, third party networks that uh, don't cost us any money necessarily because they're just public utilities if we choose to use them may have utility in the future and that's what we're beginning to explore so um speed t plus five man that's all we need to say i, I get it okay by the way any questions or comments or anything put in, in chat and same thing uh uh if you are have a question even our panelists please raise your hand and do the same thing because everyone here is for your benefit also. Christina, go for it. I don't want to dominate the Q&A here. Thank you, Kat. Well, I think this is an incredible bullish institutional use case for the Ethereum network. Uh, and speaking about scaling, uh, so we are all looking forward to Ethereum 2.0. Uh, so uh, my question to you, John, do you think that, well, the institutions already have in mind that there will be upgrades uh, very soon and all these deals and, uh, uh, and projects that are putting on the network uh, actually are related also to this uh, expectation from the Ethereum network? So I, I should point out, so I, I'm, I'm the chairman of the board of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, um, but I, I, it's worth mentioning that Ethereum is by no means the only smart contracts platform out there. There are others that look particularly interesting and useful. Uh, in the one point, let's say the smart contracts 1.0, we've got Tezos, smart, smart contracts 2.0, we've got Polkadot, Cosmos, Near, Avalanche, and others. Um, I think, so when we talk about Ethereum, I think that the conversation is broader about these autonomous uh, public utility smart contracts platforms for settlement, let's say, that's a, that's a big word. Um, the people in the financial industry, you know, I, I follow crypto Twitter and Cointelegraph and, and Coindesk and, all of, and Ledger Insights and all the rest like everybody else does. And I always see that the financial industry um, doesn't really get much... Uh, much, much uh, uh, wiggle room, you know, we're, we're, we're the, we're the whipping boy of, of the, of the financial world for some, for, for whatever reason. And that's fine. I get it. Um, the truth is that banks like Santander and other large financial institutions, we have teams of people who understand this stuff perfectly well, inside out, understand what's going on and can anticipate the future. But we're constrained by um, 
business as usual, existing, uh, let's say, industrial scale financial franchises, and also, of course, regulation and the need to, we, we cannot make a mistake, right? Um, because if we make a mistake, there's, there's risk there, whether it's, whether it's operational risk, financial risk, reputational risk, all of these things. So thinking about um, how these networks will upgrade, we're in the process of going from dial up to broadband. We know that is happening. And uh, the job of the financial institutions now is to anticipate what this may mean for our businesses. For example, I could imagine a future where there is a global settlement network for um, a, an asset class of securities that operates in a fully uh, controlled private permission layer two on top of a public blockchain network. We can anticipate maybe what, and by the way, private permission doesn't mean anything other than whitelisting. You can run a smart contract right yeah. now where the participants are whitelisted by some entity to participate. So this is not a million miles away from what we already know and understand. Now, where things get really interesting is where you could take, let's say a security that's issued as uh, an ERC-20 or some other standard that becomes a standard on a blockchain, uh, a Tezos equivalent or whatever, becomes eligible or useful for uh, what I would call not DeFi, not pure DeFi, but Reg DeFi, regulated De decentralized finance, where the where the parties are known and understood. So this migration from dial-up to broadband, low speed. That's what it is. It, it is. It's it's a yeah. migration, is what it is. Yeah. I, I'm going to take some other quick questions too. Let me go over to Soccer. Soccer, go for it. Who's out there? Who's in our in our audience? Soccer, what's your question? Hey, thanks, Ken, for having me. John, uh, Mira, and everyone on the on the call. It's absolute. It's an absolute pleasure to listen to you guys. Uh, John, I was wondering. You've been around since the early days of enterprise blockchain. How do you see this space spanning out in the next couple of years, even more long term? Do you see the space surviving, or do you see us going to a complete open open world? Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Soccer. Um, I think it's like uh, the, the, how intranets, which started in the 1980s, really, and the internet uh, kind of migrated and became one of the same. You've got one that's open and public, and the other one, uh, I have an intranet at work today, and but my intranet and the internet operate on the same protocol and communicate with each other seamlessly. I think that's what we're going to see. I think we'll have probably an internet of public permissionless, and I think we'll have intranets of permissioned and layer twos sitting on top and who knows what layer three will bring. There we go. Let me go to another question out there. I apologize if I don't pronounce your name properly. I'm not that sharp, but let me go to Nias. Is it Nias? Hello. Come on, Nia, I just unmuted you. Come on, unmute yourself. If you don't unmute yourself, you don't get to ask the question. All right. You lost that opportunity. Moving on, <laughs> but, uh, how about the ether fees? Um, for a $100 million bond transaction, inconsequential. Yeah, it's so small. Okay, I get it. Um, layer okay. two will solve that problem and layer two is here. We just need to use it. Okay, let me go to Amir. Amir, I'm gonna, in, trying to be fast on this guys. Let's see. Where is, there he is. Amir, are you ready? You got your question, go for it. Amir, unmute yourself. Guys, if you ask a question inside the chat, I am gonna allow you to actually speak inside the, the talk. So please unmute yourself when you when you uh, are asked, okay? Let me go to Safe. Safe, you get to ask the question. Go ahead, Safe. Unmute yourself, yeah. ask the question. There uh, you go. I, I wanna ask um, about Dogecoin. So a coin that has no actual intrinsic, intrinsic value, Having it pump drastically, uh, what does that have to say about the crypto market and the volatility behind it? I, what I like to do is, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to hold that question for Mai. When we bring up Mai, I want to focus exactly what John's doing right now. So we'll get right back to you on that, Safe. So let's everyone please focus on the topic of what's on hand right now, and that's this gigantic announcement. Well, John, when will this be finalized? Meaning when will this, is it now finalized moving forward and Cointelegraph could write about it or are we still going through some of the muck? We already uh, wrote about it. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> I guess it's final. Um, so, so the way that um, typical financial market transactions work is there's a trade date, which was yesterday. And then usually settlement happens a few days ahead. Usually settlement would be T plus five. 
So everybody agrees on a transaction and then settles the money a few days ahead. Now, what we did in this case, um, we, um, we did the trade yesterday in the afternoon and we're settling today. Um, so settlement is, is finality. Settlement is the, simul uh, is the exchange of title of cash and securities. Um, you know, like when you go to buy a car, you got to give the car salesman your money and he gives you or she gives you the car. And at some point there's an exchange done. And the same is true in any financial transaction. So settlement is today. Um, I'll have to check my other chat to see if it's final, but it's, it should be closed here in, in the next minutes. Christina, why is this exciting in your eyes? Well, I also think that it's a great coincidence that last week there was uh, the Berlin update uh, deployed in the Ethereum network that actually reduced gas fee cost. Uh, and this week we see this really big deal, but not only in terms of uh, financial amount, but in terms of the actors involved. Uh, so, John, do you think that uh, this, like, did you plan this to come after the Berlin update or it was just a coincidence? No, we didn't. But... Uh, we did notice, so you know, something like this doesn't just happen uh, in a day or a month. We've been, we and I, all the parties involved have been working on this project um, in some respects for about a year, which is normal. There's a lot of things that have to be checked. And in all of our tests, um, we were, you know, running tests on, on the mainnet uh, and would see from time to time that, wow, you know, transaction fees are really high. And of course we can plan for that, no problem. And then this week we were quite surprised that transaction fees seem to have dropped by, you know, from 300, 400 gig away to our to 40, 50, 80. And of course, you know, that, that relates to uh, the Berlin upgrade, but also I think to how miners are running these minor uh, uh, mm. extractable value algorithms, um, which is a separate topic for another time, um, which basically takes the, the process of, um, you know, arbitrageurs bidding and bidding and bidding and driving up the prices. So there's a combination of factors, I think, in terms of gas prices. It's not just the Berlin upgrade, maybe it had something to do with it, of course, but also I think what's happening now with, with uh, flashbots and, and these other things. Just for the audience, gas is not about gas and petroleum. It's <laughs> it's just a slang word to, well, slang, official term for successful uh, transaction commission on the Ethereum network. So it's yeah. called gas fee. I, I should actually define, and, and, and thank you, um, Christina, for pointing that out. Within the context of blockchain discussions, the word gas is about, it doesn't mean gasoline, it doesn't mean petroleum, it does not mean oil. What it means is that there's a computational fee for processing transactions. We call it gas because it's kind of a, a similar concept. In the same way, mining is an analogy to gold mining rather than actual physically mining something. So it's just an analogy. Hamid, I wanna let you ask a question. Go for it, Hamid. Hi guys, uh, the question for John. We've been looking at, um, and hi from Dubai, by the way, Mira, I think we are very close. Um, uh, John, basically, we've been looking at this STO since a while. Um, I'm an advisor to uh, the chairman of a big group, uh, multinational group, and securitization is like hot on the table, especially for our um, under underutilized real estate assets. But I haven't seen any successful real estate securitization properly done with a ledger um, recognized by the government on the title deed or um, proper securitization of any asset in the regard of a ledger properly chained to the government records. More or less what I see is that most of the securitization done by the underwriters trust or the reputation, nothing less, right? So the bond is very exciting what you've been we are working on. And uh, we'd, I'd love to hear your view on that one. What do you think about the entire your market? Okay, so your, your point specifically relates to where is the actual legal record of the register of ownership. Now, in real estate, there's usually a title register somewhere in an office with paper and files where the legal rep rep record of ownership is actually held. And in real estate tokenizations that have been done, 
that does not change. There's still a piece of paper and then someone creates a token that refers back to the piece of paper. So you got this ledger one, which is the legal rep record of ownership and ledger two, which is a representation of that. It's tokenization. NFTs are like that, right? There's a real world piece of art that the legal representation of ownership is, a, is, an, is a, an ERC 721, for example. Now, what we did with this bond transaction, and we did this previously in 2019, um, but under French law, in this bond transaction, the legal record of ownership is the public Ethereum blockchain. You want to know who owns what? There is no go to an office and talk to a government official. You go to the blockchain, and there you see a smart contract address. And in there, there's a subset of addresses of who owns what. Now, the actual real world identities, they're private um, to, let's say, permissioned actors. But the legal representation of ownership is there. For tokenization of real estate to occur at scale for securitization purposes, we will need to find a, uh, a jurisdiction that allows the legal representation of ownership to be on the DLT versus in a government office. And that's something that has to happen. So there's a difference in the, in the you know, I'm a digital assets guy. We say native versus backed. You know, backed for most people is a stable coin. There's a dollar in an account and there's a stable coin. Native is the only record is on the blockchain. And that's, that's a step that we're going to get to. And I think once that happens, we're going to see an amazing explosion of, let's say, financial market innovation and all kinds of interesting things. Because once you've got a native token, now you can do DeFi. Example, you can plug it in and make it composable and collateralization and lending and all these other things on top. Great question. Um, would require a much longer answer, I think. And that's exactly why you want to go to the blockchain summit. And the Future Blockchain Summit and FinTech Surge because John will be there. John, thank you very much. We know that you may not be able to stay on this call because you have other stuff going on. So um, if you want to hang out, you're more than welcome to, but we know you're a busy guy changing the planet right now. I'll hang out for a few minutes. Um, I'm always interested to hear what my, my Santorini has to say because it's usually provocative and interesting. Whoa, well, my, how's that for kind of an intro? What is your focus in life right now? What's your passion project going on? happening passion project wow okay um i'm gonna try to say something without sounding boring then compared to um to what uh, john has just said there so uh, i would say most of my days and nights unfortunately have been taken up with um uh, looking under the bonnet of the marketing crypto asset regulation uh that the eu commission um rolled out in september so uh, but it's quite interesting. I've also been um, heavily involved with uh, a less, um, I would say, focused on financial services sector, the um, a project led by the um, WF, and that is actually looking at st how stable coins and CBDCs could be used for, for um, cross-border disbursements. So it's probably more along the lines of the cashless initiative that uh, Mayor I was talking in Dubai. So it's, well, it's quite interesting. Yeah, sorry, Ken. No, but, but the whole cashless side, now you're looking at the whole EU on a cashless environment is what you're doing, right? No, I'm doing it two things, actually. So the, the market in crypto assets is potentially about providing some kind of regulatory perimeter to cryptocurrencies and stable coins. Um, but that would be from a financial services sector perspective. So um, allowing STOs, allowing trading, exchanging. And on the other side, I'm looking at CBDCs and stable coins and how we could... Um, globally work together to actually allow those to actually be used, particularly in um, aid, financial uh, payment disbursements. I just so, want to use, I just want to say one word and maybe you can answer it really easy. Ready? Ireland? <laughs> it's nothing to do with Ireland. Um, it just happens to be me. Um, so no, uh, there's, there's, there's not, I mean, it's, it's not a jurisdictional, it's not a, a question of, of a jurisdiction per se. Um, I, I work, I advise the, the finance minister in Ireland, um, you know, I'm, I'm in terms of future looking at what could be coming down the track over three years ago, uh, I put blockchain on the table for him to look at and we've been looking at it um, and certainly learning a lot from panel discussions and like this. Um, so the, the, the minister is also the, the president of the Eurogroup. So being president of the Eurogroup mm -hmm. and looking at the digital Euro perspective, obviously we need to be on top of understanding what, um, what that could be. 
Um, he's also part of the consortium at the EWF thing, for example. So that's why I end up involved in those interesting stuff. Christina, who would you say would be the most progressive of the European countries when it comes to blockchain? That's a very interesting question. I think actually the the, the secret is an effort uh, in uh, in unified efforts. So I think that on the uh, cross border initiatives are going to be uh, more powerful than than any uh, state initiative. Um, May, can I ask you a question about uh, Asia? Sure. Because like, well, now we have two CBDCs that are uh, already launched. So the Bahamian uh, sand dollar and the East Caribbean CBDC. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm expecting the next to be China because well, they are yeah. pushing their digital currency very <laughs> hard. I suppose that it's related to the Olympic games that are coming there very soon. And uh, well, it's already announced that uh, the tourists and the foreign athletes will be able to use CBDC. But another mm -hmm. interesting news that came this week was that the Chinese banks uh, that are part of this initiative started promoting uh, CBDC against the existing payments methods in China. And here I refer to Alipay and WeChat Pay that Mira was talking about today mm -hmm. uh, that now are accounting for around like 98% of all uh, e-payments in China. So uh, May, is this uh, like some competition going on between CBDC providers, wallets and platforms and this already famous used uh, tools that everyone yeah. is using in China. Okay, listen, as, uh, this, this is the perfect kind of stuff that I'd love to be able to have a chance to, to, to talk about, hopefully in October in Dubai, because even five minutes, we won't even um, scratch the surface of it. There's two things, right? There's cash and there's digital payments, and people keep confusing the two. Like, and it's very important to, to, to realize they're very different. You know, the cash is pretty much your coins and your notes and the stuff that you have in your money. This is the stuff that is risk-free, that you can take, nobody can find out where it goes to, you can use it whichever way you go. And then there's the digital payments. And that's the digital payments is what actually happens between banks and between central banks. And then there's the whole, obviously, reserve issue. So I am not an economist. I've had to learn a little bit about macroeconomy and monetary policy and, and national sovereignty because it's all linked to this use of CBDC. Um, I saw even in the chat a question about when is that gonna happen? Well, cash and CBDCs are different and how central banks work, it's something that, you know, I've said, if you have the time of a coffee, go ahead and understand it. So they're quite different. Yet this is what actually will be driving a lot of what you just mentioned there, Christina, in terms of there's the element of supporting the use to cash the you and me, okay? This is what I call the de democratization of money. And that's my absolute interest in blockchain. Like the kind of stuff that John is doing, I think, at financial services sector, it's the other side, to me, the commercial government macro side of what blockchain can do. But my real interest is that democratization of money. The you as a person has a choice to say how, depending on the transaction or where I am or, or who is going to see it, I get to choose how I pay for that thing or where they purchase it. And that's very different than what can happen with you um, at, at corporate level and with central banks. So if you take the example of Asia, um, the WeChat piece, I see that clearly. That is the force of democratization of money. This is people wanting to say, you know, I just, I, it's handy, it's easy, it's in my phone, I do it, bang. You don't think about it but too much, okay? And then the other side is the digital ring, maybe the potential that, you know, the Chinese government might not say that. And I appreciate this is recorded. I hope I'm not getting into trouble. <laughs> but the, the idea here is if you have an easy to use, easy to transport, and this is cross border, you know, low gas fees and so forth, a digital ring, maybe you could become the next reserve money. So well, how is digital Dubai, then then how does digital Dubai do it? Because you're doing that, you're incorporating WeChat, as you mentioned in your presentation, you're able to do all of that. So theoretically, you're creating that cross-border relationship then, right, Mira? Unmute yourself. 
Yes, <laughs> there we are. So yes, this is uh, this is something we're we're definitely exploring. And um, so uh, with the Dubai Cashless Working Group, we're phasing our approaches as to the maturity of the region as well. So mm -hmm. um, I mean, the region here compared to the landscape which May is working on, the EU landscape is a way more mature than the region here. But definitely, lots of strides have been happening, especially when it comes to CBDC and the uh, Dubai's exploration, whether with China or with Saudi. And uh, we're just waiting to on. Uh, uh, how that is going to unfold and what is the future there and how what other countries will also be open to uh, bring up uh, joint CBDCs uh, with with the UAE here and then how we can enable that through the, the platform that we want to create for for cashless Dubai specifically. But uh, if I can come in there, Ken, uh, I think what Mera said is an excellent point. Um, uh, sometimes we, you know, she just mentioned, for example, you maybe be more of a mature market right. that could actually go against you. And particularly when really, because think about this, um, look at the EU, you've got 27, 28 countries, each one of them with their own legacy payment systems. Yeah, like every bank, every corporate bank will have their own, there's no APIs, there's no, like in terms of like a unified payment systems. I mean, internally, obviously we have SEPA, we have a few things, but to move, to align all of that technologically, but then also jurisdictionally or from a regulatory perspective to allow for example, the CBDC or a digital euro will take time. Whereas you take, for example, what China has done, um, they have agreed very quickly on, on a digital euro, sorry, digital yuan. They've actually asked one, two, three banks to roll it out, the private sector to do it. And they've done it quickly because that fragmentation of systems, that fragmentation was not there or it was not old. So the like of Dubai and all that area, it's, just because it doesn't have that legacy, you could bypass that, literally leapfrog directly to, to a system that could be used without having to deal with those barriers of the old technology. So you're or basically saying it's like, the, it's like the mobile industry compared to the twisted line space. So old phone companies, sure, they may have migrated to a next level, but the ones that had nothing were able to jump over everything because yes. they created their own infrastructure. Yes. Interesting. But then Dubai's got a plan for that. I mean, because if anything, the size of the, the, the government is, I mean, let's face it, Dubai's probably one of the fastest moving governments on the planet. They do things very, very quickly, and that's to their advantage when it comes mm -hmm. to this. So uh, just, just a thought. No, like, listen, I mean, Mira just said there, they've been doing, you know, they put this uh, digital cash uh, working group in six or eight months. Um, in contrast, we're looking at digital euro. I know we've had a, co a consultation out there, but the pro they've, they've agreed to maybe uh, give it a go ahead sometime next year. And if it was to happen, it would be in a horizon of um, three to five years. So in comparison, there's very different speed. Yeah, I think Christine Lagarde mentioned four years at least for, for the deployment. But do you think that the pandemic and all the like digitalization and other pr uh, pr priorities uh, have uh, well, impacted positively or negatively these developments in Europe? Like, listen, I, I, or the country? No, I think it's a fantastic question, Krista. And I listen, take it from me, okay? I um, Maybe a bit of background for uh, for people as well. I, I would say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a recovering retail banker. Um, I was in Dubai at the height of the financial crisis. So I have seen all types of, of bad stuff happening, unfortunately, when it comes to, to the banking sector. Um, and but with experience with the private sector, I've brought it into to, to, to my role now as government. I get to see things maybe from, from a different um, point of view. Um, I'll try to go here with you. It's just that... Um, um, there, there is move. Um, uh, sorry, there is. The, gotta say, I started with the person going down the hall talking blockchain about three years ago. People thought I was coming out from a different planet. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking. I was like this weirdo with a square head talking stuff that sounded like the Matrix. Um, and people didn't, you know, weren't comfortable talking to me about blockchain. There was a fear about this this technology and what it could be. But two things, two things have happened that have made my role as, uh, as this, you know, uh, uh, as this future advisor, Horizon Scanner, it's made my role so much easier because now I don't have to evangelize or explain or convince people now it's happened. One clearly was the, um, the Libra white paper when it did come out in June of 2019. I think that was a really good and excellent point in terms of wake up call. 
And pretty much soon after that really was COVID. And that's the reality of it. Because with the move to digital payments, with the move not only from us personally having to pay with, you know, with our, 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 our smartphones, but also for companies to have, particularly SMEs, small retail companies that had to reinvent their business models and go online and then quickly had to find digital ways to actually accept and, and pay. I think that clearly has brought forward that move to digital payment infrastructure and the need to connect globally, respective of where the market is, forward by maybe 10 years. So those two steps have really, really helped, I think, uh, to the point uh, that regulators and policymakers cannot say they don't understand or they don't know blockchain. It's just not, not the dumb thing anymore. It's just like it wouldn't. Whereas a year and a half ago, I could still go into a meeting and, you know, having to go, have you heard about blockchain? Have you heard about Beacon? Do you know what yeah, then let's good? go back to, let me go back to that question again without you being political and cautious. Okay. Which country in the EU seems to be the most progressive when it comes to blockchain? Um, okay. I would say, oh, that's going to be very tough. If I say that in a, personal capacity because you know i can't speak for on behalf of anybody else in the government um i'd say if is there only one single one i think germany has done a lot for the smes uh, uh for the law uh, so has france i mean even france france particularly i think for holders of cryptocurrency so that's not blockchain overall for the technology okay no. um i don't say that there isn't one particular country ireland is a small market so what Ireland has done on the other side was um, we are we were the first country to actually have a government a, a, a government wide uh, working group looking at blockchain, um, supporting the blockchain Ireland, which is like a private pr um, private public kind of um, uh, meetup group where we actually have been looking at this for over the last four years. So. You've got Netherlands, for example, Luxembourg have actually been quite open to supportive, but there's different points. Um, so the blockchain piece is very different from the crypto piece. Um, so if you were saying a crypto friendly type jurisdiction, Malta as well um, were very yeah, excellent. Malta seems to always be there. Let's do one yeah. last question before we go. Peter, please unmute yourself. You get the last question. Peter, go for it. Okay, mine's a much more specific question. Um, I'm, I'm uh, in favor of crypto. I hold crypto and I believe in the whole thing. I think it's a, it's a, a great thing. Um, I keep on hearing more and more countries talking about uh, crypto, uh, not crypto, but um, cashless currency and, and um, electronic currencies. But my biggest problem with it is the one thing that cash gives you is something tangible in hand that the government can't screw around with. And that is what I get real shivers down my neck with when I think of going completely cashless, where everything becomes electronic, which is accelerating a great deal at the moment, in my opinion. Um, and I just want to know how that can be mitigated and how that, that control can remain, the control of the value can remain with the consumer, with the owner of that value, and it can't be screwed around with by the government or by somebody else directly. Peter, where are you located? I'm in Dubai. You're in Dubai. And you've been exposed to, obviously, the cashless environment of Dubai. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you I, have... I don't use it very much, but yes. So you use cash in most of the places you go? Yeah, generally speaking, for day-to-day -day transactions, I use cash, yes. Maybe it's me, but I think this might be a generational thing, too. I mean... Possibly. Yeah, yeah. I, I accept that completely. I'm not, I'm not uh, the, the, the springiest chicken anymore. But, uh... <laughs> Um, but I'm open to ideas. I don't have a problem with the idea of cashless. What I have a problem with is the, the potential issues that it brings in the future that I don't think anybody has actually really addressed. The little man with an electronic account somewhere or another that can't get any kind okay. of resolution. Who wants to try to take a stab at that one? Uh, I, I can say, I mean, I, I'm, from a from a Dubai perspective, I won't be able to 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 speak to that, Peter. But um, that has been it's been looked at as part of the discussions we're having uh, with the European Commission on these marketing crypto assets. And, and again, this goes back to the point I said: there's a big difference between money or cash, and then what's what's your 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 digital payments, okay? 
Um, and it obviously it's around consumer protection. It's about also um, whatever law might be at European level or, for example, in jurisdictions, um, which actually would be that dispute of who do you pick up the phone to? Where's the customer service? Uh, quite frankly, what you're saying here is when we're talking a, a decentralized type of platform, you've got a problem. Who do you call, right? Now, having said that, the point uh, that John was making earlier is that when, when settlement, the finality of that settlement is almost instant, or in the cases of decentralized, decentralized finance, where settlement happens on a smart contract instantly, the, the potential of having a dispute is very small, if almost negligible. So the consumer protection aspects about who do you call or who do you actually complain or do you've made a mistake, um, I, I said I can only speak to for, from a European perspective. They are being looked at uh, as part of and being and trying to build into into the regulation. But that mostly gonna is gonna affect the exchanges, purchasing and support. Maybe not the cash. But like the reality was, as well, you've got money, you lose it. What do you do? My good job, good That's job it. tackling that. And I want Mary. You want your Mary? Yes. Mary and from a Dubai it? perspective, I completely get you. So I, I come from a family where I have my father who thinks the exact same thing. I go into the office in the morning, come back, and it's always part of the dialogue over lunch. And what, what I mentioned earlier is that Dubai it's a city of choice. So uh, we want to cater to to everyone, to the to the tech savvy, to the person who uh, is obsessed with digital currency, to the person who wants to hold on to his cash. It's a place for all. So even the cashless strategy, uh, our first phase of this strategies until 2025 where we do, we do not aim to transition Dubai to 100% cashless that would be that would be you know uh, taking away people's options from what they want to do and how they want to use their money that they actually earned or they have actually uh, you know inherited or whatever uh, we want to give you the option whether you're you want to use cashless is there the entire ecosystem system is built uh, it's available it's uh, convenient safe secure but if you want to use cash cash is still available it's available everywhere uh, to transact with the government, to transact with uh, with the retail, whether to obtain certain services, we're not taking that away. But in the future, I have a feeling we'll see the more benefits going towards a cashless environment in the future. Not that is today. that is definitely it because you know that that is cultural. It's uh, as yeah. as the culture adopts different uh, technologies, it beca it's, it's more interested in it. You know, understand the ap appetite of people here. You just go with with what people want. So we just yeah. But I want you to go think about what happened a few years ago when Modi uh, went and looked at what was going on with their currency and how he had to migrate to go to a newer currency because of the black market of the old currency. And we'll see governments taking more control of this in the future. And I'm not saying Dubai or UAE is gonna do this, but I think overall we'll see governments clamp down more on cash and go towards cashless. It's the advantage to the governments themselves. And I know well, my old generation doesn't wanna hear that. So also one thing to, to really consider is that uh, Dubai is a, is a very unique place where Dubai city itself is a very cosmopolitan city, but the currency is not a Dubai currency. It's a UAE currency that is yeah. regulated by the UAE central bank, which is would add which adds another dynamic to the story here as well. So just between different jurisdictions and what works and what not, what not is also another factor that uh, affects all uh, the the outcomes of the strategy and how we want how fast we want to achieve things as well. Well, we and want to thank our. Wait, real quick. I want to do this. Uh, Christina, hang on. I want to thank our speakers for joining us today. Thank you so much. Christina, you get the last word and then we need to promote next our next show. Thank you very much, Ken. Well, I just think that cashless society, digital payments uh, should be also considered from the perspective of the global population. And there are countries with devaluated currency where cash practically doesn't have any value. Uh, uh, so I think this this is very important when we are talking about decentralized technologies, we should be looking at the world through the eyes of others, of unbanked, underbanked, and from countries that come from volatile economic situation. So, and I find it pretty um, interesting that digital comes from digital slating for a finger that is actually has nothing to do with, the, with digital as we understand it now. So thank you very much, back to you, Ken. All right, so there you go. Uh, again, everything we're being discussed, I'm hoping we'll have deeper discussions in uh, Cointelegraph on everything we're touching upon. You come out with how many articles a day? It's overwhelming. You guys are just pumping out articles. I don't have over time to read them all. Well, I'm uh, I know, it's crazy. You're like business insider for crypto. Use that one. I think it's a better example, actually. Thank you. Okay, yeah. I, will, I will stick oh. with it. We're back every other week. So our next week or our next guest is going to be Brett King. 
And Brett King, uh, besides being a futurist, he has written all the bank series, Bank 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. He spoke, or 4.0. He's worked with multiple banks around the world. He's considered the banking expert. You don't want to miss this. And of course, we want to make sure that you have signed up or you're prepared to come to the Future Blockchain Summit and FinTech Surge happening October. Please sign up. I want to thank every one of our panelists, and of course, my co-host, Christina, for joining us. And we'll see you next time. And get all your questions ready for the next time because we're going to answer them all together. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. you, Ken. Thanks, Christina. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Ken, very much. Christina. Pleasure.